want to get away with it. So it's now become to the grand finale of the season. <laughs> so uh, let's kind of take us off the Anapana Sakya Sutta and let's see what happens as we, as we go along here. So we have just been looking at the uh, some of the preliminary things that we need to establish in order to do the mindfulness of breathing and about it being a practice that is done in seclusion and how important it is to establish mindfulness in front of you. And uh, this idea again of mindfulness in front of you, Pari uh, Parimukkam Satim Upakapetra is the power behind that. And this word Parimukka is the one which often is uh, the question, what does that mean? And this is where you get this idea that you have to watch the breath at the tip of the nose or the upper lip or something like that. that but uh, in context, and I think this has been uh, um, established by those people who studied this, the context doesn't really uh, allow that from the sutta. The sutta, as it means more like you know, having presence of mind in, in right here in the present moment and in this present space right here. Something like that seems to be the idea of parimokka. So, then what happens? Once your mindfulness is established through your practice over a long period of time and also by just uh, doing the right thing uh, at the particular time, uh, then it says it, ever mindful, you breathe in, ever mindful, you breathe out. And uh, one of the interesting, little interesting words here is the little word ever. What is the word ever doing there? Yeah, the, uh, the reason why it is there is because there is a little party word called Eva, and Eva is the thing which is translated here as ever. The problem is that the word Eva can have different meanings depending on context. One of the things is ever is like an intensifier, but another meaning of Eva, which is even more common, is just or only. Yeah, just mindful, you breathe in, just mindful, you breathe out. And if you look at it, it makes far better sense to have just mindful rather than ever mindful. Because ever gives the idea that you are really mindful all the time. Your mindfulness has become very strong already. But if you, in a second we're going to look at the process here. And the process is one where mindfulness actually increases over time. You don't start out ever mindful. The ever aspect of it is actually something which develops as you do the practice. So, so I need to think like that. Just mindful you breathe in, just mindful you breathe out. Yeah? It makes better sense. What, what does it mean then? Just mindful. Then. And what, what I understand it to mean that and it fits with this other idea we were looking at before, the idea of a dependent liberation where this cannot be done by will. Yeah? This meditation process is not something which is done through an act of will or an act of doing. So just mindful means that, means just that. It means that you are mindful. That's all. You don't do anything apart from being mindful. You don't make the meditation work. You don't try to produce the outcome. You create mental states out of thin air. You allow the mental states to arise through natural cause and effect uh, relationships. That is how you do it. That is the idea of just mindful. All you are is mindful. That's all you have to do. Nothing. No willpower, no doing, or anything like that is required. And actually, it gives quite a significant a different meaning, doesn't it? One little word like that actually changes the meaning quite significantly. Yeah. And this is why it is important to read these things sometimes with a fair amount of care, so you don't uh, get the, the wrong ideas about this. So, so just mindful, you breathe in. Uh, just mindful, you breathe out. Uh, that's all you do now. Then we come to the uh, 16 <coughs> steps. Uh, and the first tetrad, the first four steps, they sound as follows. Breathing in long, you understand that I breathe in long. Breathing out long, you understand I breathe out long. Breathing in short, you understand I breathe in short. Breathing out short, you understand I breathe out short. Uh, you train thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of the breath. You train thus, I shall be out experiencing the whole body of the breath. You train thus, I shall be in tranquilizing the bodily formation. You train thus, I shall be out tranquilizing the bodily formation. So this first tetrad, and this comes further down in the, this particular sutta, I haven't actually included it here, but this is said to be equivalent to the contemplation of the body. Yeah, so this uh, this is like the um, 
Kanya and Vipassana, the first part of the Satipatthana, the four Satipatthanas, this is the first one, the Kanya and Vipassana, the body contemplation. So watching the breath is all you have to do to fulfill the body contemplation test. And this gives you an idea of how flexible the term body is in the Pali language. You know, normally, the breath, uh, you know, the body, you think, of, you think of it as much more than just the breath, but the breath is barely an aspect of the body at all, actually, really. Uh, but the point here is that the word body is very flexible in Pali. It means any kind of uh, uh, collection of phenomena that are collected together as a group, but that is what is meant by body. Yeah. It's a bit like an English body of evidence or something like that. But yeah, a group of evidence uh, or a corporate body or something to that effect. Yeah. So this is all you have to do to do body contemplation. Yeah, the whole body contemplation can be done by simply watching the breath. That's already makes it quite uh, simplifies things quite a lot. Uh. So uh, breathing in long, you understand. I breathe in long. Yeah. Breathing out long, yeah. you understand. I breathe out long. Yeah. That's all there's to it, yeah? You know your breath, that's basically what it means. Uh, and the idea of whether it's long or short is really not the main issue here. Uh, the issue is just the awareness of the breath. Uh, so long or short is just a, it's just used to, to, sh to show that you know the breath is there, yeah? Uh, so you are aware of what is going on, that's really all it means. Uh, so you understand that it is long and then afterwards it's short. Why is it in this particular sequence? Well. Uh, often because your experience of the breath would follow this particular pattern. Uh, start off long, you are really relaxed because you're already mindful, so you breathe quite long, uh, and as your focus narrows a little bit, the breath becomes shorter. I think that is the reason why you have this sequence here. Uh. And then uh, we come to the third part of this. Uh, uh, it says he trains them. So in the previous one it says you understand, now it says you train them. Uh. Yeah, and how is it that you train it? You train Asha breathing, experiencing the whole body of the breath. So why does it move from understanding to training it? What is going on? Does training, does that mean that now we're supposed to use the willpower, is that what I mean? Now we're supposed to create a, the full experience? Like somebody was asking before, are we supposed to watch the whole length of the breath? How do we actually watch this breath? What does this mean? And I think what it means is that the, uh, when mindfulness arises in the beginning, yeah, it is not super sharp. Yeah. Mindfulness comes uh, in a vast variety of qualities, uh, degrees of sharpness. Uh, so training here doesn't mean that you do anything in particular. Yeah. What it does it is that you wait. You wait, uh, you relax, you are at ease, you allow the mindfulness to be there. Yeah. You keep on focusing on the breath, and as you do so, it is a natural consequence of your focus. Uh, and you start seeing more and more of the breath. The mindfulness becomes sharper by itself automatically if you are ready for it. Yeah, if you've done all the all the background, all the other factors of the normal eightfold path, and then it just happens. But training means that it doesn't happen straight away. It takes a while. It is not a natural part of of, of ordinary mindfulness that you have this broad you know, depth of mindfulness, broadness of mindfulness. It takes a while for that broadness to kind of gradually increase. And virtually, you see the entire breath uh, from the beginning to the end. Uh, of course, there's a variety of uh, degrees here, uh, but you see more and more of the breath uh, as your mindfulness sharpens. Uh. This is what this means. Uh. Um, I think, anyway, that's my, my understanding of this. And then, uh, uh, what is this idea of the whole body of the breath? Uh? You see, the uh, of the breath is parenthesized. Why is that in parentheses? Uh, I shall breathe and experience in the whole body. The reason it's in parentheses is because the Pali says uh, Sabbakaya Patisambedi, uh, which means literally to experience the whole body. That's what it literally means. Uh, this doesn't say anything about breath later. Uh, and this, of course, leads to interpretation problems. Exactly what, do, what, what are we dealing with here? Uh, are we dealing with the breath or are we dealing with the whole body? as a physical experience. And the commentary says that it refers to the breath. Yeah, and I think that is a very reasonable interpretation because this is anapanasati after all, there is mindfulness of breathing. So it's reasonable and the, as we shall see in a second, when we talk about the bodily formation or the bodily activity, that also refers to the breath. And this is something you see in several places in the sutras. So here, uh, I think the natural understanding of this uh, is that it must refer to the whole breath from beginning to the end. But uh, there are 
people, there are meditation traditions that interpret this differently, that they interpret as a whole physical body, that we start out with the breath, then we feel the whole physical body, and then we go down to calming down the breath in the step after that. But to me that seems a bit unnatural, because why would you move between different objects like that? It seems a bit distracting, actually. But if it works for you, and you prefer to interpret that way, and it gives rise to the calming, and it gives rise to the right effects, you can do that as well. It doesn't really matter, as long as the process of meditation works, and you get the results, and eventually you can incorporate all the following steps and all of that, and then there is no problem for that sort of interpretation. But, but uh, yeah, so that is just to give you, sometimes you can see that interpretation, there's always a little bit of interpretation creeping into the suttas, uh, which makes it uh, both interesting, sometimes a bit exasperating, because sometimes you don't know what you believe. One person says A, other one says minus A, and then you don't know which one to follow. But. So, then you continue training just by being mindful, just by being aware. And the next part here, he trains thus, I shall win in tranquilizing the bodily formation. Bodily formation, kaya sankara, uh, better translated as bodily activity, in my opinion. Does that make sense? The breath is a bodily activity, certainly fits very nicely. So you tranquilize the bodily activity. First of all, you expand your awareness. And when the, as the awareness expands, everything starts to become more peaceful and tranquil. Yeah, and uh, all through this, actually, all, all of this is actually quite a delightful process if you get it right. Uh, it's all quite beautiful. You tranquilize it down. You start to become peaceful, quite peaceful already at this point. Uh, so you tranquilize, and again, it is a natural process. Uh, there's nothing you have to do. All you have to do is kind of stand back. Uh, remember to be the passenger on the train. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're watching only one thing, the breath. Uh, that's all that is there in this passenger seat. You see the breath, that's all that is available to you to, to watch. So you're aware of this, and things become very tranquil and very nice already at this, at this particular stage. The trick through all of this is just to stand back, allow things to be, and as you do so, these things will happen as a consequence. Yeah, and uh, all the uh, conditions in your life, all the things that you do outside of meditation and all these things, uh, that is what will decide eventually how deep you go, how far you go. Where you kind of, where the plateau, kind of, you, you reach the plateau, you can't go any further, you will decide about all these other things. Uh. So that is the, uh, the bodily, uh, uh, the, the bodily contemplation, uh, and uh, already, this is already quite nice already. Now, the second tetrider comes up next. And the second tetrad is all equivalent to the feeling contemplation. Yeah, the, the Vedana Vipassana on the uh, uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta. So this is equivalent to contemplation of feelings. Uh, and this is where uh, some you know this question that we had the other day about when at what point should I go experiencing the feelings in the body? Somebody was asking that question. Uh, and this is exactly what that question is about. At what point do I go from contemplating the body to contemplating feeling. That is really what that question is about, because that is a particular interpretation of the idea of, of a Vedana Vipassana contemplation of feelings. So, but that which I see now, just, just now, is that uh, um, actually you don't have to contemplate the feelings in the body at all according to this sutta, because this is how you do the contemplation of feelings. So, yeah? <coughs> you, tr you train thus. I shall breathe in experiencing rapture. Uh, you train thus, I shall breathe out experiencing rapture. Uh, I, he trains, uh, you train thus, I shall breathe in experiencing pleasure. Uh, you train thus, I shall breathe out experiencing pleasure. Uh, you train thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mental activity. Uh, or the mental, yeah, okay, mental activity. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the mental activity. Uh, he trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the mental activity. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the mental <coughs> activity. And um, here, just to very briefly, mental activity really here refers to the feelings and perceptions in your mind. Yeah? And these feelings here are already about rapture and, and joy. So these are already very positive feelings and perceptions that you have at this point. So when you look at this, yeah, and you think that this is actually how you contemplate feelings, uh, 
It's a pretty good deal. It's all about nice, beautiful emotions. <laughs> no need to contemplate pains in the body or pains anywhere. All you have to do is contemplate joy and happiness. And by doing that, you fulfill this particular Veda Vada Pasana. That's all you have to do. And you fulfill it. Isn't that remarkable? You will, you will, many people think that, well, you've got to contemplate all feelings. You've got to contemplate the pain, you've got to see the neutral feelings and all that. Because how can you fulfill something without contemplating everything? Yet? And this, we'll see this in a second again. But the point is that you have already at this point gone beyond those pain, painful feelings. You left them behind. And that is really sufficient when you leave something properly behind, completely behind. Already you have contemplated them deeply enough to know that they are anicca, impermanent, to know that they are, well, you know that they're suffering, obviously, painful feelings, and that they are anatta. You, you can let go of them. They're not an inherent part of who you are as a person. You don't have to contemplate those painful feelings. Good, good isn't it? Yeah, let go of that. So when we go on those retreats, let's say, you know, oh, now you've got to stay with the feelings in the body. Uh, you don't have to do that. Not necessarily wrong, but uh, it's far better not to do it. Uh, the Buddha says in the sutra that there is two kinds of paths. One, uh, four kinds of paths. One is the happy, happy and fast path. Uh, then there's a happy and slow path. Uh, then there's a painful and fast path and painful and slow path. Uh, so you, which one would you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> And the, the Buddha actually says, he specifically says, well, the, the happy and fast one is the best one. That's what he says afterwards. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, but it depends also a little bit on your inclination, it depends a little bit on the spiritual faculties, which one you do. But if you can do the happy and fast one, obviously that's what the one you should be doing here, because it is the best one. So uh, that is the great thing about this. All you have to do is to go for the uh, pleasure of these things. Uh, um, so very briefly, what does this mean, rapture? Piti is the Pali word for this. Uh, and uh, you see this everywhere. You see it in the Bodhangas. Uh, uh, you see it in the uh, 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 dependent liberation sequence. Yeah, It's everywhere. That has to do with meditation practice. Piti is one of the necessary steps that take you to samadhi. Real samadhi is an is a experience that involves piti, uh, rapture, joy, whatever in that. And of course, if you uh, read the standard definition of the first dharma and the second dharma, these are experiences that uh, involve piti, involve joy. You know, the joy based on seclusion, joy based on samadhi, respectively, in those two dharmas. So, so and how, do you, how do you feel this? What, what, what do you, how do you know it is there? And then how do you know it's there? It's you, you feel pleasure, you feel like pleasure, you feel joy, yeah? Everybody knows what joy feels. Uh, uh, well, most people anyway, but absolutely everyone. But do you have some idea what joy is? Uh, that's what it is. Uh, and this is a fairly strong form of joy, and you can often feel it physically in the body. Uh, yeah, you feel kind of goosebumps sometimes. You feel kind of like currents or energy going through the body. They're very pleasant ones. Uh, yeah, and uh, so it is quite a strong form of joy, and quite physical sometimes. Uh, that is how, you know, and, it, and this can be experienced differently by different people. Uh, but that's essentially what it comes down to. Uh, the body is still there. You haven't really gone completely beyond the body yet. Uh, and that's why it is a phys largely a physical sensation at this point. Mental and physical together, really. Uh. So this is what it starts out as. Uh, and then, uh, as you train with this, you start experiencing pleasure. Pleasure is sukha in Pali. Uh, and sukha <laughs> is usually a more profound experience of pleasure uh, than piti. Uh, it is when the... Uh, the, the, the physical sensations kind of calm down and it becomes more of a mental sensation. Uh, you have the sukha, uh, it becomes more disembodied. Uh, the body starts to fade more into the background. Uh. Yeah, and uh, so that is, and then as you, uh, the next one then is feeling the mental, experiencing the mental formation. Uh, and that is very similar to the two previous ones. Uh, it just means that you experience the whole experience, whatever it is you have now. You experience that, the entire perception, the entire feeling. Uh, Adasudhata translates, translates this as um, uh, experiencing emotion, uh, yeah? and, uh, which is not entirely wrong, or it's maybe even quite good, because it is more easy to understand than, men, than the, uh, than the um, mental formation, or is a bit more obscure. Uh, so basically emotions, that's what you're experiencing at this point. Uh, 
So you have a full experience of what is going on, perception and, and feeling, and then you continue and this calms down, yeah? It becomes even more calm, even more peaceful. Right? It's kind of a, this, is, this amazing path. There's two things happening in tandem here as you do this path. You're becoming more and more, the happiness is becoming more and more outlandish. Yeah, this is what it is, it's outlandish. It's, it's these are things you haven't really experienced before in your life. It's more and more kind of, whoa, what is going on here? At the same time, it's becoming more and more peaceful. Man. These two things go in tandem. Man. More and more peace, uh, more and more happiness as you do this. Uh. <coughs> this is how you know that you're on the right track. Yeah? Yeah? This is what is going on. Man. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky, and this is one of the things that you have noticed as well in during your meditation, uh, judging from your questions, uh, to move from the uh, experience of the body to the experience of feelings. Uh. Yeah, because sometimes the feelings don't really come. You may feel that you are with the breath and you stay with the breath, stay with the breath, but no feelings arise. How come I don't get any pleasure or happiness or joy out of this? Uh, and uh, so sometimes what you need to do to move from the Kalyan Vipassana to the Vedna Vipassana part here, uh, from the first four to the next four, and the first tetra to the next tetra, uh, sometimes you have to kind of give the mind a little bit of a nudge, uh, yeah, a little bit of a uh, was one of these topics that the Buddha always talks about to get your meditation kick-started, uh, uh, contemplating uh, something nice, something that you've done in the past, just very, very simply. This is not a major contemplation. Yeah? It's just like allowing the mind to dwell on something positive. Uh, uh, just kind of bringing to mind that the Buddha is your teacher, or whatever, whatever works for you. Uh, sometimes you need a little bit of a nudge there for the mind to kind of bring that beauty in with the breath. Uh, Sometimes it happens completely automatically because the peace and the quietness of the meditation, they are so attractive that the joy just arises automatically as a consequence of the general peace. But sometimes you need a bit of a nudge. Yeah? So you kind of let go of your breath just a little bit and you just kind of allow a positive experience to arise. Bring that in with you back to the breath again and then the joy may arise as a consequence. May arise. It doesn't always work. But sometimes it does work. So that is the contemplation of feeling, yes? And now you know the answer to your question that you had the other day about uh, experiencing the body, going to the sensations of the body. Don't have to do that because this is what you really have to do according to the Sutta. Huh? Then uh, we move on to that next tetrad. And the next tetrad goes as follows. You train thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe in, gladdening the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe out, gladdening the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe in, stilling the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe out, stilling the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe in, liberating the mind. You train thus, I shall breathe out, liberating the mind. So here we are going beyond the mere feeling, we're going to the experience of the mind. What does it mean to experience the mind? And uh, what it means is that uh, to know what the mind is, you have to abandon all those things that are not mind. When all those things that are not mind are abandoned, you are left with mind. So our ordinary experience is a mix of all kinds of things. We experience the senses, the body, the physical things, and the mind, all kinds of you know, jumble together in this mass of experience, it's very hard to kind of distinguish what is what. So what is happening here is that as you become, things becoming more and more tranquil, you feel more and more happy here, the body is fading away here, the five senses are fading away, yeah? You're not really, already now the senses are becoming very weak, you have given up seeing a long time ago, and the hearing is kind of gradually fading away here. So all of those things are turning more and more into the background. And what is left, what remains, because the senses are disappearing, what is left is the mind. And that mind usually appears, and this is why this nimitta is so uh, significant, yeah? Because the mind usually appears as a bright nimitta uh, in, in your uh, mental, visual field. Uh, it's like seeing the sun or something like that, or sometimes the moon, depending on, on how bright it is. Uh, yeah, this is why it matters. And that thing that you see there uh, is not something you're seeing with your physical eye, something you're seeing with your mental eye. Uh, and uh, that is where you are starting to experience the experience in the mind. The physical body now is really, really in the background. Uh, all that is left of it is the breath. Uh, 
the bread, if you look for it, you can still, you still see it there, but it's kind of back, going into the background now. Uh, and the mind is coming into the foreground. Uh, this is what, how I interpret here, experiencing the mind. Uh, and this is really just following Ajahn Brahm. He's kind of the, the one who also teaches, I, I think he teaches it in this way, I'm pretty sure he does. I can't remember what he says about this thing anymore, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's what he does, because it is a very sensible and natural explanation of this particular sutta. Right? The commentaries here, they, they interpret some of these things quite differently. Yeah. For example, they interpret the experiencing the rapture already as the uh, jhana uh, experiences. Uh, but um, and that may be, may be the case in certain circumstances. Uh, but I think the point here, and this is kind of when you come down to the liberating the mind, which is the fourth one here, that is really where you're talking about samadhi and jhanas, because this is a standard a metaphor in the sutta is to liberate the mind is a metaphor for attaining the jhana. So you have this is the standard description for jhana experiences. So this is, I, I think, it, to me, it seems fairly obvious that this is where jhana really happens. The rest is just a path into the jhana, so, and it fits with the general progress you find elsewhere in the sutta. So, so uh, you experience the mind, and once you kind of have that nimitta arisen, uh, then the question is, well, how do you deal with that nimitta? Yeah, what, what do you have to do next? And this is what the next part of it is here. You gladden the mind. How do you do that? By, by lots of activity? Of course not. Yeah? Now it's, you really have to be passive. The deeper you go in this meditation, the more passive you have to be to develop it further. Yeah? So you just have to stand back. You have to be the real passenger now. Looking out the window, seeing the beautiful moon, or even the sun, or whatever it is. And just be aware. <coughs> As you keep your focus on this limiter, it becomes brighter. Yeah? Yeah, you're glad it, it becomes more joyful, it becomes more luminous, it has all these positive qualities brightening up. Yeah? At the same time, the next step then is the stilling of that nimitta. It talks about concentration here. I'm telling you all of this, not because you may not be at this particular point yet, probably many of you are not, but it doesn't matter. It's good to have these things as a kind of map for where you're, where you're heading. Yeah? <laughs> Uh, so then you have the stealing of the mind. Uh, how does that happen? It happens exactly in the same way here. Yeah. You stay with that nimitta. Uh, you don't di diversify your perception out. You stay, you focus very simply, uh, very simply on this uh, particular object in your mind. Uh, and as you focus on that, and just allow that to be without effort, uh, just using mindfulness, uh, the mind stills down. Yeah? The process of gladdening, the process of uh, uh, stealing continues from the previous tetra. Uh, but now it is with a pure mental object rather than with the breath uh, as it was before. Uh, sometimes you can still feel perhaps the breath very far away because you're still doing mindfulness of breathing, uh, but really it is really, really fading away very rapidly at this particular point. Uh, um, sometimes people ask, how do you go from the second tetra to the third tetra? Uh, how do you move from the contemplation of feeling to the contemplation of mind? How do you give rise to this nimitta? Uh, and usually the way you give rise to it is simply through the joy in the mind, and, it's not, and it comes by itself. And initially when it comes, it's often very unstable. Right? And people say, they see a flash, yeah, flash, bang, oh, it's such a flash, and then it all disappeared again. Right? And I'm trying to hold on to it, yeah, I've got the name of that, I'm trying to hold on it, and straight away it disappeared. Right? So this is the thing, you, uh, you, you build up enough a kind of power, enough momentum by watching the breath, by building up the happiness, building up the joy, until the nimitta becomes quite stable. Huh? That is when you kind of almost make a shift and your main focus, instead of being the breath, your main focus now becomes the nimitta itself and the breath falls into the background. Huh? There's often a slight shift in focus at this particular point on the path. Huh? Usually it happens naturally, huh? uh, but sometimes you have, to, uh, you, you have to kind of go back to the breath a little bit to make it powerful enough huh? and then the transition happens as a consequence. Huh? You know, just little, kind of little hints. And don't worry too much about these things. Uh, for those of you who have a little bit of experience of this, you may know what this is about. Uh, uh, but uh, once you get there, you probably don't want to ask for advice anyway, because you do what happens when you get to these stages. Uh. So, you're stilling the mind, yeah? And as you're stilling it and gladdening it, uh, this limit becomes more and more powerful. Uh, and eventually, you kind of, you are... Uh, uh, the mind almost like merges or falls into or uh, the into the nimitta. Uh, it's like you enter something. Yeah, it's the sensation of kind of entering a different state. Uh, 
And the reason you are entering a different state is because there comes a point when you are leaving behind the entire world of sensuality. This is what is happening here. It's not as if there is any sensuality in the mind, but it's just that the senses haven't been completely abandoned yet. There comes a point when you abandon the senses completely, and at that point you're leaving the world of sensuality absolutely behind. There's no access to that world anymore. That is why there's a sense of falling into something, of going into something different. At this point is where people sometimes feel a bit whoa, either really excited or really bit worried or scared, yeah, because you're actually giving up something that is you're so used to. Yeah? Of course, there's nothing to be scared about that because everyone has so many people have done this before, yeah? but you're giving up something that is so close to you. Yeah? So it can, can be difficult to make that last transition into a real Dharma state. Yeah? So this is the last thing you do on this uh, third tetra, the mindfulness of breathing. The Mochayam Chittang, liberating the mind. Again, you don't do it. It happens as a matter of course. You are passive in the process that's happened. You are liberated from the world of the five senses. You are liberated in large part from the will. Once you go in there, you can't do anything anymore. You are kind of stuck in that state. Yeah, very happily stuck. You don't want to be anywhere else, so it's no problem. Uh, but uh, it, of course, being able to let go of the will, the ability to do, the ability to access the will, that is also quite it's a bit challenging sometimes. Uh, but then, when you are able to do it, uh, that's, uh, of course, you realize the benefit of that. Uh, so this is what it's about, yeah? So it's all about stilling, 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 uh, more and more happiness, uh, until eventually you let go of an entire world, uh, Kama Loka, and you enter the next world, which is called the Rupa Loka, the Loka, the world of the Dharmas, and this kind of thing. So that is this uh, process. Uh, and if you take this process all the way to that point, uh, what happens is that uh, when you come out of those dharmas afterwards, or whatever, or even if it isn't the full dharmas, uh, uh, they lead to tremendous <coughs> insight and ability to see the world in a new way. Uh, and this is what this last tetra is about. Uh, it's about what happened as a consequence of the previous 12 steps. Yeah, many of you have been asking about insight, how to develop insight and understanding, and this is what we come to now. He trains thus, I shall breathe in contemplating impermanence, anicca. You train thus, I shall breathe out contemplating impermanence. You train thus, I shall breathe in contemplating fading away. This is Viraga in Pali here. You train thus, I shall breathe out contemplating fading away. You train thus, I shall breathe in contemplating cessation, nirodha. You train thus, I shall breathe out contemplating cessation. You train thus, I shall breathe out contemplating relinquishment, patinisiga. You train thus, I shall breathe out contemplating relinquishment. So this is the last part, and this is where you are really focusing on insight. Yeah, you can see that. And uh, as you can see, you do this after you have completed the mindfulness of breathing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to contemplate all the twelve or complete all the twelve steps, uh, because sometimes you're not ready for that. Uh, but it means that after you have finished, that is when you kind of look for the insights, not while you are doing it. Uh, and this is actually quite different from uh, how. Uh, he, what people call insight meditation, where you actually try to get the insights in the meditation itself. But the way the Buddha explains it here is that you do it afterwards. And the reason for that is because while you're in the meditation, you want to focus on the one object without getting too distracted. If you start looking for anicca while you're looking at the breath, then you will distract your samadhi, you will distract your ability to stay focused. So you wait till afterwards, then you look back on the process. Yeah, and this is kind of the critical issue here when it says contemplating impermanence. What does it mean? It means looking back on the process you have been through. That's what it means. And seeing these qualities, impermanence, fading away, cessation, and relinquishment in that process when you look back upon it. So, so what are these things? What is actually, what are you contemplating here? What does it mean to contemplate anicca in this process? And what it means is that when you Go back, yeah. you see things are changing. Yeah. That's, that's all it really means, to see how things are moving along, yeah. becoming different. Yeah. The breath is anicca, in the sense that it is becoming more and more subtle. Yeah, that subtlety is a sign of, uh, of impermanence. Yeah. 
Yeah, the body, as it goes along, the body is changing. It's becoming less gross, becoming more refined as you go through this. Yeah, there's certain mental qualities, feelings, perceptions are always changing as you go through this. And you see that process of change. But this process of change, this word anicca, in its most basic uh, meaning, it just means change. Yeah? Kind of waves on the ocean going up, going down. Uh, but the process of change, anicca, in its deeper sense, means much more than that. And what it also means, it also incorporates the idea of fading away. Fading away means something starting to disappear. Yeah? That is also incorporated into anicca, but anicca in its broadest sense. It also incorporates in it the idea of cessation, because when something ceases, when something is completely gone, obviously it is impermanent. Yeah? This is where impermanence takes on a much deeper meaning when things start to cease and disappear completely. And this is a deeper meaning of anicca. So all of these factors here are really aspects of anicca, but they bring out different, uh, different angles on this particular term. So things are fading away. What does that mean? You look back on the process. Yeah? As you look back on this process, the deeper it goes, you see your breath is gradually fading away, becoming more and more subtle until it's completely gone. Your body is fading away. You have less and less contact with your body. You move into a world of the mind until the body is absolutely gone. You have no access to it anymore. The body fades away until it ceases completely. Yeah? When the body is completely gone, completely seized, you get insight, you understand that the body cannot possibly be you. If you cannot have access to the body, it cannot be an essential part of who you are, because you can't access it. If something is an essential part of you, you should be able to access it. You can't. Yeah, the body is gone. And this, of course, is why even going into a jhana state gives you profound insight. You don't need to actually, you don't, you know, as it says in the beautiful Brahmakana verse, wisdom and samadhi, wisdom and jhana, go together. These are not separate things. Why? Because when the body is completely gone, you gain full insight into the body, basically. You don't have to do anything more than that. And if the body is partially gone, well, that gives you a little bit of insight into the body. That's the body. The five senses exactly the same thing. That is another way of looking at the body, if you like it. The senses fade away. And eventually they are completely gone. If the five senses are completely gone, well, you, they can't be you. They can't be an essential part of who you are. They disappeared. You are still there, or something is still there, even if it isn't really you in an ultimate sense. But you're happy without those senses. They're gone. You understand, again, anicca. You understand fading away. You understand cessation of these things. Find hindrances. Yeah, this is an important area of investigation. Look at what happens in your mind as you make progress on this path. The hindrances are going down. Yeah, you become less restless. The mind brightens up, which means that there is less, less uh, tiredness and lethargy in the mind. Yeah, uh, the mind becomes more and more wholesome, more and more glad, which means that you know anything to do with ill will is long gone a long time ago. So you can see how the hindrances and the opposite qualities, which are the bodhangas, the factors of awakening, are coming in the place of the five hindrances. And this is one of the things that is important in the suttas, this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 reverse, reciprocal relationship between the five hindrances on the one hand and the seven factors of awakening on the other hand. As the hindrances go down, the seven factors of awakening uh, arise and become stronger and stronger. And sometimes you're not sure what is going on. You, know, you, you can't even see the hindrances very often, but you know that they are disappearing because the bhajanga, the factors of awakening, are becoming stronger there. So you start to notice this, you look back, you see how your mind is getting purified, how these defilements are dis disappearing. At the same time, all these super positive states are, are coming into their place. So, yeah, things disappearing, anicca, viraga, niroda, impermanence, fading away, cessation, and alternative qualities arising in that place. So, you see the will. You see the will fading away, because what is happening as you go through this, you are doing less and less. Yeah, gradually the will is fading away. That gradually uh, uh, the mind becomes more and more peaceful. Nothing is going on there. Until eventually you realize that the will is completely gone in the drama state. You can't do anything anymore. You don't have access to your will. You can't even choose to do anything even if you wanted to. But you can't even want it in the first place because there's no will there. <laughs> so 
And that, of course, is profound, yeah, because this shows you that the will is not you. It's not, an, it's not an inherent aspect of who you are. What it is, rather, it is a torture, because once the will is gone, you feel much better. It is neither you, nor is it happiness, it must be suffering. You check it out. The will becomes kind of very unimportant after that. You have no interest in the will anymore. Yeah, and it's so strange, because we identify so strongly with the will, most people, that because you identify with the will, you actually are literally identifying with suffering, you're identifying with the problem. And now, for the first time, you start to realize this uh, actually needs to be let, let go of completely if I want to be happy. Then uh, there is all these other things that you can follow as well in this process. You see feelings. Yeah, you overcome the painful feelings quite early on in this process. Uh, and the happy feelings start to arise, and certain happy feelings disappear, the pita disappears, and the sukha arises in its place. Certain feelings disappear completely, and other feelings arise, and all that is left is some very powerful positive feelings. It starts to give an insight into feeling. Painful feelings can have nothing to do with yourself, because they can be gone completely. And this is why you don't have to, again, investigate or stay with the body with painful feelings. You do it through this process instead. Same thing with perception. Perceptions can be very varied. But the general idea of perception here is that it becomes simpler and simpler as you go through this process. Less and less things happening here. Yeah? Your mental content becomes more and more unified around a very simple uh, perception, like the nimitta and these sort of things, uh, as you go through this process. Uh, so you understand the permanence of a large part of perceptions, uh, fading away and the cessation of those perceptions. Uh, the deeper you go in this process of anapanasati, the more powerful will be your insight afterwards as you come out of it. You reflect back. And because your data, when you get very deep in samadhi, your mind is incredibly bright and very, very clear. Afterward, it is very clear what has been happening. It's very easy to remember what's going on. And that is why this is a very powerful moment for insight. You understand what is happening here. This is how you this is how it happens. And as this insight matures, Eventually, you get to the very last one of these four factors here, and that is the uh, relinquishment. Yeah, patinisaga in Pali. Yeah. And the relinquishment is literally the letting go of desire and craving for these things. That is the relinquishment. So you see them ceasing. Because you see them ceasing, and, and you now understand that they are problematic, they've not, got nothing to do with you, you let go of them. You relinquish, relinquish them completely. You don't have any craving for them anymore. And this is how you get to the end of the Buddhist path. Why are you going to hold on to what is suffering? It doesn't make any sense. Of course you're not. So you let go of that. That is the last act of seeing things as impermanent. Permanent. You relinquish it all. Let go of craving, craving for these things. You are no longer attached to them. You are free from these things. Freedom from these things doesn't mean they have disappeared. It means you are no longer attached to them. You have no craving for these things. That's what it means. So it's kind of exciting, isn't it? And that is how this uh, uh, remarkable Anapanasati takes you all the way to freedom, all the way to the end of the Buddhist path, uh, all the way to kind of final uh, liberation from all the suffering, all the problems in the world. Uh. And then the, the Buddha says at the very end here, because uh, that is how mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, so that it is of great fruit and great benefit uh. It's always slightly understated, great fruit and great, even that is an understatement in this case, isn't it, really? It really is of great, it's the absolute, the highest fruit possible anywhere, it's of great fruit, great benefit. <laughs> so that is for you the, uh, the marvelous Anapana Sati Sutta, and uh, I hope that makes it more clear to you how this path actually works and how it functions. It is actually quite simple. Uh, and it's one of the wonderful things that I, when I started reading the Siddha, that I discovered is that you don't have to go through all of these complicated meditation techniques. So you can stay with something simple as the breath, and that will take you all the way out of samsara, all to the very end of everything. Yeah. And that is such a relief, in a sense, because it simplifies the path. We need to simplify things. So things are always a bit, things always tend to get too complicated in this world. The simpler things are, the better, the, the easier it is to do. Yeah. This has got nothing to do with, uh, you know, with intelligence or with anything like that. Simplicity is easy for everyone to do, regardless of, uh, uh, regardless of who you are. Uh, 
And, and this is why this is uh, so useful. Uh, so now to uh, come back to the path again, because we can now see how the path works hopefully quite easily. Yeah, the gradual process of purifying yourself, starting off with the uh, uh, with the ordinary virtues and kindness and all these things on the path, but then moving into the purification of the mind, which happens through right effort. Uh, we were I talked about sense restraint, which is part of right effort. We talked about sampajanya full awareness, which also, in a sense, is part of right effort. And when the mind reaches a certain degree of purity, that mindfulness arises, and you're ready to do things like mindfulness of breathing. There's no exactly clear cut-off point here. Yeah? It, it, it's not, there's no kind of absolute scientific, now you start meditating, now you finish with this fact, now you start with this one. There is a lot of overlap. So don't try to pinpoint these things too narrowly, because then you will miss out. You just learn through experience roughly what you have to do there. And then through the process of mindfulness of breathing, yeah, you then eliminate the very last hindrances in your meditation practice. That is what's happened through this process here. Gradually eliminate it, using a bit of insight by reflecting back on what is happening, and just using the calming process itself as a means of letting go of the defilements. And then, eventually, when the defilements are completely gone, then that is where you enter the jhana states and you attain, you end up with the very last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma, Samadhi, this uh, extraordinary, extraordinary jhana states uh, that uh, uh, come next. Uh, so let us now go back to the uh, suttas that we started out with uh, and just complete the gradual train all the way to the end. Uh, so now you have to go to page one to the third page of these uh, uh, students, uh, to come back to the third page, please, starting from the beginning. And uh, so, okay, so this is what happens next. I'm going to read through this daily class, not comment too much, uh, uh, because uh, now we're getting to the very deep states of meditation, and uh, it is not always relevant. It's, not re it's only relevant for a small minority of people. And if you have questions about this, we can, this thing can sort of be. Uh, spoken about, uh, more, perhaps more individually here. So, now we have come to the paragraph which says, having thus abandoned, yeah, having thus abandoned these five hindrances, uh, page number three, I hope you can all find that, uh, uh, from the beginning here. Yeah. Okay. So, having thus abandoned these five hindrances, in other words, by this process of mindfulness of breathing, and of Satipatthana practice, uh, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, uh, secluded from unwholesome qualities, uh, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied and applied by sustained thought, uh, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Uh. This Brahmin is called the footprint of the Tathagata, something scraped by the Tathagata, something marked by the Tathagata. But a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully awakened, that the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, that the Sangha is practicing the good way. So I want to just comment a little bit on the first jhana, because this is the, probably the most important one of these to get right. Once you get the first one right, the other ones tend to fall into place. But <coughs> well, the first thing here is the idea that uh, the hindrances are imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom. Uh, yeah? This is a very important point because uh, it means that unless you actually, as long as there is any residue of these five hindrances in the mind, uh, you won't be able to have full insight because your wisdom is going to be weakened by these hindrances. Uh, so you have to overcome them completely here. Yeah. That's the first point. Uh, the second point, and this is a point made in the Nanakapala Sutta, Majjhima 58, uh, and this says that uh, uh, the only way to really keep the five hindrances away, uh, yeah, uh, over long periods of time, is to attain the Dharma. If you haven't attained the Dharma state yet, uh, then the hindrances are, are very likely to come back at any time. Uh, Especially if uh, what you're doing is a little bit scary because you're abandoning things that are very close to you. Uh, if it is a little bit scary, the hindrances are much more likely to come back again. So the more deeper your samadhi, uh, the better equipped you are to deal with these insights. Uh, 
And this is why, and this is one reason why this jhanas are so powerful and so useful in this practice, because they stabilize you, they enable you to get insight, they abandon the things that weaken wisdom, they take away all the vested interest in the external world. No more vested interest, you don't care anymore if you see or you hear or whatever, all that can just go away. That is when you are ready now. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, Vibhicheva Kamehi. And uh, quite secluded is, or fully secluded if you like it, sensual pleasures, uh, the word karma again, this idea of the five senses. And uh, karma in the plural, uh, throughout the suttas, refers to the five senses. So here, a more uh, accurate uh, translation would be completely secluded from the five senses. Uh, yeah, this is how I would translate this. Uh, the reason they have sensual pleasure here is because they have the same word for, for karma uh, in English, regardless of whether it refers to desire or it refers to the five senses. But this, as I mentioned before, this word can mean both. Uh, yeah? Secluded from unwholesome qualities or states. Uh, this is Vibhicca Akusalehi Dharmehi. And this refers obviously to the five hindrances. Yeah, they're completely gone. You enter upon and abide in the first jhana, accompanied by applied and sustained thought. Uh, so here you have to be very careful about the meaning of the word thought in this context. Vitaka uh, and vichara are the two words. And uh, here it is remembered we are dealing here with the very last remnant of thought uh, before it ceases completely in the second jhana. In the second jhana, Vitaka and vichara is completely gone. So because the first jhana is a very final step before the second jhana, it must be the most refined type of thought that is possible in samsaric existence. And what is that? Well, I think the natural meaning of that is that the mind is simply a slight movement of the mind, as it is described in the, you know, by meditators who know about these things, also described in the Visuddhi Magana, the tiny last remnant of movement of the mind. Why? Because thought really is a movement of the mind, whether it's verbal or pictures or whatever it is. It really means at the end it is about the movement of the mind. And this is the very last movement of the mind. It's not the verbalization. It is not a picture producing thing. It is just a slight wobble in the mind or something like that. So this is important, yeah, because this is where you get very uh, strange, sometimes, interpretations of these jhana experiences. And then you have uh, the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Uh, and um, uh, so this is Piti Sukha, this is a, a Vivekata Piti Sukha, which is this, this one. So it's a particular type of Piti and Sukha that comes at this particular point, a very profound Piti Sukha compared to what you had before. And it is the particular Piti Sukha that you only find in the first jhana. It is a Piti Sukha born of seclusion from the karma world, the world of the five senses and from the five uh, hindrances. And then comes this very powerful thing at the end here. And this again shows you what these things are, really are, how, how profound they are. This Brahman is called the footprint of the Tathagata. Yeah, you know when you get here that the Buddha has been here before. This is how profound they are. The Buddha would have walked through this territory. Something sprayed by the Tathagata. Again, the Buddha would have been here. Marked by the Tathagata. He would have marked it, analyzed it, know that it is present there. Yeah, and this is uh, uh, this shows you the profundity of these things. Uh, these are necessary things that the Buddha would have walked through on his path to awakening. Uh, and they are profound. They are the Sambhoda Sukha, the happiness of awakening. Uh, they are the uh, Upasama Sukha, the happiness of peace. Uh, the way they are described in the suttas, they are the Uttarimanusa Dhamma, the uh, superior human qualities, the Allah Arya Hanadasana, we say, so the distinction in knowledge and vision, worthy of the noble ones. Yeah? This is how the jhanas are talked about again and again in the suttas. They're always classified together with the four stages of awakening. Four jhanas and awakening very, very close to each other. They share so many things in common. The profound happiness, a large degree of insight, yeah? the sense of moving out of samsaric existence. They're so close to each other. And for this reason, it is very important not to underestimate what these things are. These are not just 
and it, and it, 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 it was nothing to do with ordinary experience at all. You're entering an entirely different world when you're entering the dhammas fully. Not, these are not dharma lights, these are real dharmas. Yeah? This is kind of the important point here. Yeah? So uh, please keep that in mind, because this is something that is so misunderstood on this Buddhist path, so many places. Uh, and uh, so, and I'm very glad I had someone like Adam Brown to uh, point these things out to me, otherwise I probably would misinterpret them myself. And I think, yeah, well, the dharmas are really easy, just chill, just relax, bang, dharmas. <laughs> 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 So, then we have the other three dhammas. Again, with the stilling of Vitaka Vichara, yeah, the complete ending of Vitaka Vichara, the last remnant of thought disappears. The bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second dhamma, which has confidence. Confidence here means you are confident in the object. There's no more wavering. You're absolutely single-minded, singleness of mind. And the object is completely still, without any applied or sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of stillness of samadhi. This is the first time you reach absolute samadhi. It's absolute because the mind is absolutely focused on one thing without wavering it. That's what that means. This too is called the footprint of the Tathagataha. Yeah? With a fading away as well of rapture, the bhikkhu abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third dhamma, on account of which the noble ones announce that he has a pleasant abiding here, who has equanimity and is mindful. So uh, here, if the rapture, the piti is fading away, uh, all that is left is sukha, yeah, the happiness of the mind. Uh, and uh, it says here that you have equanimity and you are mindful and fully aware, feeling pleasure with the body, uh, this is very easy to misinterpret uh, because kāyena, sukha kāyena patisangvedi does not in this case mean the physical body in any way. It means the body in a much larger sense. It means like your personality. Your, uh, you know, your, uh, here it really means you have a direct experience of sukha. That's really what it means. Uh, you're feeling a direct happiness for the first time because the piti has gone. Uh, all that remains is sukha. Uh, and to translate this as a, a physical body is actually very misleading in this particular case. So, and there's many places in the suttas where kāyena, used in this way, cannot possibly mean the physical body. It must mean the mental apparatus or your uh, immediate experience of things. So, and that is, uh, uh, to me, it is absolutely obvious that that is what it must mean in this particular case. So, and on account of which the noble ones announce uh, he has a pleasant abiding here, who has equanimity and is mindful of that. <coughs> he has a pleasant abiding. You have just reached the most happiest state you can reach in samsaric existence. Oh yeah, he's got a pleasant abiding here. <laughs> this is what I mean. You know, this is the problem with the suttas. They really are understated. Yeah? They, really kind of, they really make the most extraordinary things sound very ordinary here. This is, you have to be watched out for that, because these things are, are extraordinary. You have just reached the highest happiness possible to reach in samsaric existence. When you go from the third jhana into the fourth jhana, you let go, let go of all happiness, and all that <coughs> remains is equanimity. Uh, you know, there's no happiness there, but equanimity is more happy than happiness. This is kind of the point here. Uh, this is part of the paradox of the Buddhist path. Uh, you go from feeling tremendous happiness uh, to feeling equanimity, and you realize equanimity is preferable. Uh, this is what is going on here. Uh, this is why, again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, uh, with the previous disappearance of uh, uh, joy and grief, uh, okay, whatever, uh, uh, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth dharma, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Uh. This too, Brahmin, is called the footprint of the Tathagata, but a noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened. Uh. So here, Pleasure and pain has been abandoned because these are always comes as pairs. Yeah? So if there is pleasure, as there was in the previous genre, then uh, pleasure and uh, pain are kind of two sides of the same thing. So to fully abandon pain, you also have to really abandon pleasure fully because they kind of come as a pair usually. And then when you abandon pleasure fully, all that is left is a state of neutrality, neither pain nor pleasure. 
Previous ab abandoning of joy and grief, these are the mental things, the PT and this kind of stuff. So, yeah, so now you enter the uh, full equanimity of the mind, the beauty of purity of mindfulness. Uh, and precisely because there is no happiness anymore here, this is why at this stage you have the highest chance of gaining insight into reality at this point, uh, because you have no vested interest in happiness itself. Once happiness has been abandoned, uh, and you know that there is a state preferable to happy feeling, and you have no vested interest in happiness, that means now you are ready for full insight into the nature of reality. And that is what comes next. Uh, I, we are already come to about 10 o'clock, we're supposed to have the last half an hour of meta meditation, but I feel we kind of did that last night, so I'm just going to carry on if you're okay with that, and then we just uh, carry through there. So, um, just Briefly, I want to have a look at these three uh, insights and then just kind of wrap up things after that. Uh, so, when his mind is cons when his still mind is thus purified and bright, uh, unblemished, rid of imperfection, uh, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Uh, imperturbability means nothing can kind of nothing can perturb you, yeah? nothing can shock you, nothing can move you. You are imperturbable. You are solid. Uh, he directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives. One birth, two birth, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, six, a hundred thousand, hundred thousand, many eons of world contraction, eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain. Such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I had all these qualities. And then passing away from there, I reappeared here in this life. Thus, with the aspects and particulars, he, recollect, he recollects his manifold past lives. This too, Brahman, is called the footprint of the Tathagata. The noble disciple does not yet come to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully awakened. So here you are starting to see into the nature of reality in an entirely new way. Things are opening up and uh, you, you, uh, you are kind of expanding your vision of what reality, what life is all about. Instead of having this narrow vision that this life is all there is, suddenly you see the enormity of existence and how kind of uh, uh, astonishing it really is. And uh, this is a very important point. Uh, yeah, you, this is very hard to grasp. But of course, you actually need to see these things to really fully grasp what is going on. Uh, yeah, uh, but this is a very important point. And this, what the Buddha is doing at this particular point, uh, what he's seeing is really he's seeing the first noble truth. Uh, the first noble truth is the noble truth of suffering. Uh, but you can't really grasp suffering until you see existence in its entirety. All of these lives, all of these rebirths, uh, potentially stretching on into the indefinitely into the future. Uh, only then do you understand the meaning of this thing we call dukkha and suffering on the Buddhist path. Uh, so this first insight, this is the first of the three te vija, the three profound insights. Uh, this is really an equivalent to the insight into suffering itself, the first noble truth. Uh, and how powerful is it? Well. To understand how powerful it is, you have to, you have to read some other sutras to but also talk about this and to talk about the consequences of these kind of insights. Uh, in one place, this is taken from Matamanikaya 4, the Bayabhairava Sutra, the Fear and Dread Sutra, uh, and the same thing the Buddha talks about his own life and his own insights. Uh, yeah? And he says there, when you have this kind of uh, experience, when you see your past lives for the first time, uh, he said, it's like turning on the light. Uh, yeah, before, you've been wandering around in darkness. Uh, you were kind of hitting your head, uh, hitting your body, stumping your toes against all kinds of stuff all the time. Uh, turn on the light. Now I can see what I need to do. Uh, now I see the problem. Uh, I see where, uh, what, where real suffering is. Uh, now, so this is one of the reasons why the idea of awakening is also quite nice. Uh, because you are, when you wake up, uh, then you kind of get out of the darkness of, the, of, of your sleep and you see reality for what it actually is. Uh, you turn on the light, now you can see it. Now you know what is going on there. But there's an even more powerful simile. There's one of my favorite similes of the Sutans, uh, which gives you some idea of the power of these insights. Uh, and this is the simile of the chick, the little chick in the egg, inside the eggshell. Uh, the chick is inside the eggshell. Uh, 
that one day the chip breaks out. And when the chip is inside the eggshell, like, the world is so tiny. Yeah, the eggshell is right there in front of your face. You can barely see a, a centimeter if you're lucky. Yeah. yeah, the whole world is so tiny. The world is so confined. It is so restricted, so limited. You don't really understand anything about reality when you're inside that eggshell. Huh? And then one day you develop, your beak kind of becomes sharp, your claws become sharper, huh? and then you have the ability, you, you fed up staying inside this eggshell, huh? and then let me, let me get out of here and see if it's possible to break out. Huh? So you use your little beak, you use your little claws to kind of poke little holes in the eggshell, huh? and eventually it breaks apart. Huh? And then you see the world and you realize, wow, this is just, it's a little bit different from what I thought it was, yeah? You start inside the eggshell so tiny, so confined, and suddenly, so many beings, so many things going on, yeah, it's so, dis so distracting. So, all of this, this is what the world is really is like. Yeah? And this is what the Buddha says, seeing your past life is like. Yeah? It's like, break, like a chick breaking out of the eggshell. Yeah? Reality is just so different from what you think it is, yeah? and from, actually from what you experience in your daily uh, life apart if you have some kind of special uh, you know uh, uh, special kind of things happening to you which may kind of open up your eyes to these things uh, generally speaking we are so confined in how we look at the world uh, this is what it is uh, and that is why this is such a profound insight uh. so that is the first one of these uh, insights the second one is uh, the insight into a uh, single also come up yeah so when the mind is concentrated, purified, right, unblemished, the rhythm of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Yeah? You're directed to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. Yeah? With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing. Yeah? Inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. Yeah? And he understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These worthy beings were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions. On the dissolution of the body after death, they have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. These are all bad places, yeah? Perdition. Okay, so perdition is a bad place. Yeah? And straight away, one of the things that you see there, yeah, what is it that takes you to this bad rebirth? It doesn't say anything about the last fourth moment, yeah? It says something about your general conduct. That is what matters. That is what is important for where you get reborn. Yeah? This is one, just one of many pieces of evidence to, to show that. Yeah? But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers, remember that abuser, yeah, abuse, you abuse the noble ones, uh, right in the views, giving effect to right view in their actions, uh, on the dissolution of the body after death, uh, have reappeared in a good destination in a heavenly world. Uh, thus, with a divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, uh, you see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. This is another footprint of the Tathagata. This is the second breaking out of the shell, where the chick breaks out and it sees how samsara has, is caused by your actions, where you are reborn. It is not something that you can hold on to. You cannot find a place in samsara where you can stay forever and ever after, because your actions is what determines your rebirth. And the actions only have so much momentum, only so much power. And after that power runs out, you're going to get reborn somewhere else. You understand the cause and mechanism, and by understanding that, you understand the limitations of samsaric existence. So this is the other breaking out of the shell. Wow. Okay, and of course, based on these two things, you, you start to grasp uh, the suffering, the cause of suffering, this is really the second one here, the cause of suffering, uh, and then you understand, I've got to get out of this, uh, yeah? There is no hope for this samsaric existence. Uh, the same thing going on again and again, going up, going down, being reborn here, being reborn there. You start to understand that there is no self, there is no... Uh, inherent essence inside of you that can actually guide you in this direction or that direction. It all depends on your conditioning. Yeah? Yeah, it depends on all these kinds of things. Uh. And as this kind of starts to sink in, uh, it becomes obvious there's only one thing to do. That is to get out of this whole mess, uh, to make an end of it. Uh. 
And this is what the third insight is about. Then. So, again, with a still mind that is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, you direct it to the knowledge of the destruction of the uh, corruptions of the mind. You understand as it actually is. This is suffering. Yeah? This is the origin of suffering. This is the end of suffering. This is the way leading to the end of suffering. Yeah? These are the corruptions. This is an alternative way of phrasing the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? The origin of the corruptions, the cessation of the corruptions, and the way leading to the cessation of the corruptions. Yeah? And this here, in this case, it means you refer it probably to a stream entering. Yeah? And uh, as you keep on practicing that, eventually, uh, you become a arahant yourself, and eventually you come to the final conclusion uh, yeah, that the Buddha is fully awakened, and the Dhamma is rightly proclaimed, uh, and the Sangha is practiced in a good way. Why? Uh, because you know and see exactly what the Buddha himself has seen, uh, and then you understand that uh, that is what has happened. Uh. And at the very end here it says, when he knows and sees us, uh, his mind is liberated from the corruption of sensual desire, from the corruption of desire for existence, from the corruption of delusion. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands that birth has come to an end, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. That is the knowledge of the Arahant. Birth has ended, there is no more uh, of this suffering and messing around in samsaric existence. Uh, and that is the end of the gradual training. Nothing more to do, now we can really relax. Yeah? <laughs> no more work to be done, just sit back and enjoy. Uh, until somebody comes, please teach me, you look so peaceful, give me some teachings. Uh, and then you are back uh, out of compassion, helping the world. That's what happened to the Buddha, basically. Yeah. So there you are, uh, gradual training. That's what is in store for you. Uh, <laughs> Ready for that? <laughs> so uh, this is where it's all heading. This is where it's all going. Yeah, yeah the ending. And the best way to think about this is simply uh, the ending of suffering, the achievement of the highest happiness. Uh, and if you think about it like that, it's a very accurate description of what is going on. Uh, and it's also very attractive. Uh, who doesn't want the highest happiness? Uh, who wouldn't want to end all suffering in life? Uh, it's a very positive and very beautiful one. But thinking about these things in the right way is one of the essential aspects of the Buddhist path. So you don't feel kind of put off or afraid of what is going to happen as you do this. Because it is all there for your happiness and well-being and for nothing else. So, uh, that is it as far as the sutras are concerned for now anyway. And uh, just to uh, kind of round off a little bit, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about somebody asked the important question the other day that I promised to come back to, her, and I try to keep my promises. If I don't keep my promises, because I forget sometimes, so please just remind me if I forget things. So, so I try to do that, and the uh, question was, well, how do we take these things back into our ordinary life? Uh, you've just been having these very lofty teachings, uh, and then you have to go back into the world again. In, in the world, things are not always quite as lofty here. Uh, yeah, it kind of drags you down to the little bit again, and you kind of have to go back into your ordinary existence. And one of the things that you have to accept is that you will not be able to take uh, the necessarily the good qualities that you have developed here all together uh, back into your ordinary life. Somebody asked about mindfulness yesterday, how to bring it back into your ordinary life, or, or your, or I'm not sure what ordinary, but anyway, into your kind of regular life, whatever it is. Uh, and you can't do that. Uh, and sometimes if you have found a little bit of inspiration while you've been here, some of that inspiration will disappear. Uh, if you find that you have understood the Dhamma a little bit more deeply than you had before, that too will fade away a little bit. Yeah. And this is kind of interesting because it feels like now, wow, now I really understand what's going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And but actually uh, uh, that too often fades away as we go back into ordinary life again. So what should we do then? Uh, what is the right approach to how to live our ordinary life when we come back out? Uh, what you should really first of all don't cling on to any of the things that you feel you have reached here. Uh, just allow it to let it go uh, and kind of just allow things to return to normal again as we come back. If you cling on to it, it's going to be suffering for you now. Uh, 
um, we have to kind of accept the ups and downs of existence. Uh, there's really only one thing that you need to remember as you go back to your ordinary life. There's one thing here that is the source, the foundation, the basis of, upon which everything else on the Buddhist path works. And that is the idea of living well, living with a good heart in the world, living with kindness. If there's one word you need to remember, just remember kindness. Yeah, that's all you have to remember. Yeah? If you can remember that throughout the day, all the time, moment to moment, week in, week out, day in, day out, year in, year out, you're bound to make progress on this path. Even if your mindfulness dips down a little bit, which inevitably it will, as soon as you come back on the retreat, the mindfulness will come back again very quickly and more powerfully than before. Why? Simply because you are living well. That's all you have to do now. So how can we enable, how can we be kind in our ordinary lives? Perhaps you think that it sounds easy, and it does kind of sound easy, or have to become, but you also, I'm sure all of you know how difficult it is sometimes to be consistently kind, yeah? Consistently nice to people around you when uh, they are, you know, so many things that happen in the world that are unpleasant and difficult, and people seem to be not that friendly, and all of these kind of things. It's actually quite hard to be consistently kind, to have consistently thoughts of compassion and kindness to others, that these things take quite a bit of training. Yeah? So sometimes it goes out the window. You forget about it completely. You get so uh, engulfed and so completely absorbed in your daily work, in your daily activities, that you forget about the Dharma. Huh? You forget your priorities completely. It's gone out the window. So in one word, like kindness, basically, it is almost impossible to remember it all the time and bring it back into your life. Huh? So you need something to support you. Huh? And the most important support that you can have in your life is to always come back to the Dhamma. Come back to these teachings. Allow them to inspire you on a weekly basis, a daily basis, whatever it is that you require. Don't overdo it. Don't listen to the much, so much Dhamma after you start kind of getting fed up with it. That's also silly, yeah? We all have a saturation point where we can't take in anymore. And then, okay, now I've kind of had enough. But find that balance where you have enough to inspire you, enough to remind you what is important in life, yeah? to always bring you back. And as you do that, yeah, as you keep on listening to the Dhamma, you are, you keep that brainwashing in place. So remember, brainwashing is good. Yeah, brainwashing is good for two reasons. First of all, it cleans out your defilement, it washes your brain, it washes your mind really. And secondly, it conditions you. And you get brainwashed regardless. People think that brainwashing is bad because you have read about these kind of evil cults and that kind of thing, yeah? So brainwashing is bad, but actually, you are brainwashed regardless. This is the whole point of the idea of non-self. You have no choice but to be brainwashed. So you might as well accept it. So you have to make sure that you choose the right kind of brainwashing. Yeah, get the right kind of soap powder, washing machine, this kind of thing, is it? So that it actually cleans you out properly and you can actually come out on the other end more happy and more content than when you walk into the brainwashing. Yeah. So brainwashing is necessary, it's required, uh, because that's what life is all about. Uh, just have to make sure you brainwash yourself in the right way. Uh. So come back to these teachings, uh, and as you come back to them in this way, gradually the whole process happens automatically. There's nothing you have to do, uh, and it all think, the whole thing kind of falls into place, because they inspire you, they keep you going, you are kind, you live in the right way, Gradually, 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 moving on this path. Uh, yeah, keep that rain moving. <laughs> keep that rain falling on the top of the mountain. Uh, and as the rain keeps on falling, 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 this is going back to these teachings again and again and again. Uh, read the sutras a little bit. Uh, read, listen to a Dhamma talk which uh, talks about these teachings in a way that you understand and makes sense to you. Uh, yeah, do this again and again. Keep the rain falling. Uh, and as the rain falling, you're filling up the streams. Uh, yeah? Filling up the streams is like being kind in the world, uh, being able to live well. Uh, and as the streams get filled up, the little lakes get filled up. Uh, when the lakes get filled up, they fill up the large lakes. Uh, the large lakes fill up the large rivers. Uh, the great, great rivers of the world, the Ganges, the Thames even. Uh, yeah, uh, and this is where you, Samadhi really starts to become powerful. Uh, and eventually, this it all goes all the way to the ocean. Uh, it fills up the great ocean, which is Nibbana itself. Uh, and all we have to do is to keep the rain falling on that mountain top. Yeah, if you keep the rain falling, eventually it will have to reach the ocean one way or another. That's the nature of this rain. So keep keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming. Come back to these teachings again and again and again, and then you will have 
uh, the results of this path. But that is what I would recommend you to do in your life. But, and uh, as you do that, uh, then uh, hopefully uh, you will uh, continue on this path uh, and you will gain all the wonderful benefits of this path. Uh, and then, uh, you know, great, yeah, just get better than that. Uh, <laughs> that's really all it is about. Uh, and then uh, you have a good life. Uh, you become a blessing for yourself. Uh, and you also become a blessing for the world around you, for all the people in the world. Uh, and we need more blessings in this world. Uh, sometimes there is a lack of blessings. The more blessings there are, the better. Uh, so that is how this all uh, tends to come together. Uh. Okay, I don't think I want to say anything more than that. Uh, so uh, is there any last minute questions or things that anyone would like to bring up at the very end. If not, I will uh, say a few more things afterwards. Uh, and uh, anything everyone is kind of happy here. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, so nothing more to bring up, which is good, yeah? So that's kind of, you know, when it comes to the, come to the end of this thing. So now I, uh, what I want to do now is just to kind of add a couple of things just to kind of end off uh, the retreat. Uh, and the first thing to uh, thank everyone for coming, and especially thank Prabhupada Chanda for organizing the things. Uh, I think it's been very well organized. Uh, the place is magnificent, uh, and the uh, support from the staff here, and everyone has been magnificent. For me, it has been a very nice place to do this kind of retreat, and I hope you agree. Uh, so, a big sound to Prabhupada Chanda for her marvelous uh, work. Yeah. And also to, yes, and also to everyone else as well, and for coming, the retreat isn't quite the same if there's not that one comes, yeah, so it's good. Uh, <laughs> you better hope I'm all alive and, and stay here. Yeah. So that's, that's, also, that's also a wonderful thing here. Yeah. I just wanted to say also that uh, the reason, main reason why I'm here is, of course, because I love sharing these teachings, because for me, this really is about the meaning of life itself. And, and when you think, you feel that you have the meaning of life in hand, of course, uh, you want to share it with others. Uh, because it's a joy to share these astonishing teachings with other people. Yeah. And uh, but part of it is also because I'm here to support Vendor Chanda in her uh, Anukampa project. Uh, yeah, this is basically why I'm here, and I was very happy to do that. Uh, and I wish her the very best in trying to establish a Pikuni monastery here in the UK. Uh, remember, it is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, she's basically on her own, uh, and it's very difficult to find. There's not many Pikunis in this world yet. Uh, it's difficult to find support for these things and to get it going. So it's very brave and courageous to start out on something which is so uncertain. Uh, yeah, it's so difficult to know exactly what's going to come out of this. Uh. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to support this. Uh. So if you want to support this project, uh, any support that comes in because of this, I, uh, all that support will not, not go to Bodhinyana Monastery or anything like that. All of that I would like to go to the Anukampa project. Uh. So if you uh, do, would like to support this wonderful opportunity, then uh, please do so with the knowledge that everything will go to this marvelous project, uh, which will make it easier for women also to live a fulfilled spiritual life in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, and that is both ethically appropriate, uh, but also I think it is so important in our modern world that we try, we strive for more that equity between uh, men and women, so we have the same opportunities uh, to practice this uh, remarkable Buddhist path, uh, 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 regardless of gender, regardless of anything, really. Uh, uh, we should all have this opportunity, I think, regardless of any background or whatever that we have. Uh. So, that is just a, uh, a little bit of uh, support for the Undercomfort project. Uh, and uh, my, I certainly has my support, you know, Ajahn Brahm is also behind this project. Uh, so, uh, that usually means that it has a a good potential for the future. When you've got good people standing behind it, usually then it comes together very nicely. Yeah. So uh, that is really all that I should I say anything else? Should I pass it on to someone else? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So if you would like to kind of round everything off, that's that's wonderful. Yeah.